What if Padme had died in The Phantom Menace? In the main storyline, Padme survives until Revenge of the Sith, representing her people in the Senate and becoming the catalyst for the creation of the infamous Sith Lord, Darth Vader. One of our viewers contemplated though, what if instead Padme had passed away in The Phantom Menace? That's what we'll be discussing today. So get comfy and let's dive right in. Our story begins with the counter siege of Theed, when Padme is attempting to retake her palace from Viceroy Gunray and the Greedy Trade Federation. Everything is going according to plan. The Jedi depart to deal with Maul, the contingent of Naboo security forces make their way to the throne room, and Anakin ends up going into space and blowing up the droid control ship. Everything about this scene goes exactly the same as how it did in the movies, with one key difference. Upon Padme's entry into the throne room and her isolation of Gunray, the Viceroy ends up pulling a sneaky move on her. While she demands that he surrender, Newt, being the slimy man that he is, ends up pulling a pistol of his own from beneath his robes and blasting Padme square in the forehead, killing her instantly. Normally, Nymodians wouldn't resort to such violence. However, Gunray had learned to always be prepared, and he takes the cowardly course of action in killing the Queen, rather than having to face his actions in court. How does this impact the rest of our story? Let's continue and find out. After Gunray fires at Padme, Panaka shoots back. He hits Mute clean in the chest, and the Nymodian slumps in his chair. Rune Hako rushes to his aid, and Panaka keeps an eye on the other Nymoidian. He orders that the other security officials immediately attend to the Queen, and he thinks about how he had known it wasn't a good idea to bring her into a battle zone like this. The room is engulfed in chaos. Meanwhile, while this is taking place, Anakin blows up the droid control ship, resulting in the powering down of each B-1 unit that had been fighting in Theed and on the plains with the Gungans. Panaka points his weapon at Rune Hako, and he tells them that it would be a good idea for him to surrender now. The other Nymoidian raises his hand and cowers, immediately giving himself over to the Republic authorities. From here, Hako is arrested, and a funeral is held on the boo for the young queen. Her family comes forward and says that she passed away before her time, and that she only had the best interests of her people at heart. Many tears are shed as she's paraded through the streets of Theed, and the people of Naboo go into a time of mourning. Even Palpatine, who had plans for the young queen, is floored, and he decides that he needs to pivot his plan of galactic domination. Captain Panaka is selected to be the interim monarch of Naboo, and he ends up deciding that rather than holding a vibrant parade to celebrate their people's new peace with the Gungans, instead, it would be a somber event, and it would act as another remembrance for the late Padme. As time passes, things begin to settle down on Naboo. Senator Palpatine still becomes the Chancellor, and following Panaka's term as Monarch, he is requested to fill the position of Senator for the Sector, just like Padme was in the original story. He happily obliges, and he serves Naboo as a loyal representative in the galactic government. Anakin's training continues as normal, but his thoughts still lie with his mother. Anakin and Obi-Wan train together, and they still embark on many diplomatic missions as a pair. Anakin initially struggles with the death of Padme, whom he had become attached to, but in his grief, he heeds the teachings of the Jedi, and he attempts to let go of her memory, rejoicing in the fact that she was now at peace in the Force. Palpatine, in the absence of a clear father figure for Anakin, becomes one to him, and he provides the counsel that the young Jedi believes to be sage. Despite immense evidence implicating Rune Hako in the illegal occupation of Naboo, along with his presence during the murder of a sovereign head of state, he manages to plead innocent in the courts, and he gets off scot-free. This is due to significant Trade Federation lobbying on the case and their immense interference with the Republic justice system, much like how him and Newt were able to escape punishment during the time between the Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones. The same thing happens just for Rune Hako in this situation. He gets off, and many within the Republic begin to grumble. Clearly, some obstruction of justice had taken place. This begins to stir the pot of separatist sentiments, allowing Dooku to gain support for his political idealism. Despite Padme's death, things are still working out for Palpatine. The timeline of events proceeds similar to how it did in Attack of the Clones, but rather than Anakin and Obi-Wan being tasked to guard Padme, they are instead tasked with the protection of Panaka, who had been advocating against reduced taxation of intergalactic corporations within the Senate. As he's landing on Coruscant to attend a hearing, there is an attempt on his life, just like what happens to Padme at the beginning of Attack of the Clones. 
So, as mentioned earlier, Anakin and Obi-Wan are called to be bodyguards. This time, there's no weird flirtation from Anakin, and he doesn't act creepy around the Senator. He focuses on the task at hand, and he is devoted to the protection of Panaka. Anakin and Obi-Wan still end up chasing Zam Wessel through the streets of Coruscant, and they part ways to pursue their separate quests, just like in the movie. Anakin takes Panaka to Naboo, and Obi-Wan pursues the bounty hunter lead towards Kamino. When Anakin goes to Naboo, he maintains a friendly yet professional relationship with Panaka. He doesn't go meet his family, and he certainly doesn't try to raise him up. Instead, Anakin does his duty, even when he begins to suffer the dreams about his mother. Anakin, after coping with the death of Padme, is more prepared to control his feelings as they rise. Anakin speaks with Panaka about his worries, but he has no intention of visiting Tatooine like he did in the original timeline. The pair remain on Naboo, even when Obi-Wan requests that Anakin forward his message to the Council regarding the Separatist forces on Geonosis. Anakin feels some FOMO when he hears about the end result of the Battle of Geonosis, wishing that he could have been there to help protect his master, but he takes solace in the fact that he knows that he did his duty. He gains a significant amount of clout in the political community of the Republic, as he was able to sit in on many Holocaust meetings with Panaka during this time, and he learns a significant amount about how the political system of the Republic works. All in all, the most important lesson that Anakin learns is how to better control his feelings, something that would be very important going forward. As the Clone Wars continue to rage on, Anakin still becomes a very prominent general. In this scenario, Obi-Wan and Yoda still believe that it would be prudent to assign Ahsoka as a Padawan to Anakin, and he trains her in a similar way to how we see displayed in the cartoon. However, while Anakin is still unorthodox with his techniques, and while he still maintains a strong bond of respect with the 501st, he isn't nearly as reckless as we see displayed in the Clone Wars TV show, and he faces a stronger sense of urgency to keep his feelings in check when they begin to come up. He imparts this on Ahsoka, saying that he still struggles with keeping himself disciplined, especially when he often disagrees with the policies of the Jedi Council. However, he emphasizes that because he feels most of the Order is just, he will continue to act in its service. He stands up for his Padawan when Tarkin persecutes her for treason, but he remains collected during these proceedings. Anakin still discovers that Barriss was the one who actually committed the Jedi Temple bombing, and Ahsoka still decides to leave the Jedi Order due to their poor treatment of her, and because of their hypocrisy. Anakin is torn apart by this, but he feels a better sense of camaraderie with his former master during this timeline, and he confides in him about how he feels following Ahsoka's departure. He also speaks with both Panaka and Palpatine, who had become even closer mentors to Anakin during the Clone Wars. Of course, Palpatine is still trying to manipulate Anakin, and uses both his mother and Ahsoka's abandonment of the Jedi to try and manipulate him further into pushing more towards the dark side. As the Outer Rim sieges persist, Anakin and Obi-Wan receive a call following their battle on Yorvana, and they are once again faced with Ahsoka's request to aid her at the Battle of Mandalore. This interaction goes as it does in the Clone Wars, and Ahsoka still feels disregarded by the Jedi in favor of politics. Anakin and Obi-Wan go to Coruscant to save Palpatine, and they succeed in their mission. However, during this timeline, Anakin does not kill Dooku like he does in Revenge of the Sith. Instead, he places him under arrest, not falling for the Chancellor's dark side trickery. Palpatine, while not pleased with this development, must hide his discontentment for the moment, pretending to be happy that Anakin had chosen the right course of action. Palpatine doesn't have as much leverage to work with in this timeline because Anakin hadn't massacred the Tuskens during Attack of the Clones. So, Anakin binds the hands of Dooku, and he takes him, Obi-Wan, and the Chancellor on his adventure through the Invisible Hand, and they are almost killed by Grievous and his men. However, just like in Revenge of the Sith, they manage to escape Ravis' wrath, and they pilot half a ship back to the surface of the metropolis below. As the war continues to wind down, and just before Dooku's scheduled trial, Palpatine calls Anakin to his office for a visit. Being accustomed to these in the past, Anakin obliges. This time, however, Anakin can sense that something's off, and he enters with hesitation. There stands Palpatine, facing the window, looking out over the streets of the city. He begins to speak to Anakin, telling him that he honestly believed that the young Jedi had made the incorrect decision when he had chosen to spare the life of Dooku. After all, that man had been responsible for so much pain in the galaxy. Without Dooku, there was no war. 
Anakin disagrees, telling Palpatine that he hadn't believed that it had been right to influence the systems of justice that he was seeking to defend as a Jedi. He even references Panaka's teachings to him during Attack of the Clones, stating that that is what he stood for, and he would always stand by his principles. To this, Palpatine replies that those systems were broken, as evidenced like people like Rune Hako continuing to run free within the galaxy. Palpatine tells Anakin that he thinks that it's time for good people, such as him and Anakin, to take control over the system, and that it was their time to mold the galaxy into a more just society. Anakin looks at the Chancellor, saying that he's no longer sounding like the humble man that had once preached to the galaxy that he loved democracy. At this, Palpatine smiles slyly, and he tells Anakin that perhaps he had never been that man. In this instant, Palpatine pulls his red lightsaber into his hand, and he ignites it. He provides Anakin with one last opportunity to join him, saying that he knows how Anakin feels about the Jedi Council. Palpatine also promises Anakin that with his help, he could bring Padme back to life and he could see his mother again. He goes through the entire tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise with the young Skywalker, saying that he knew how to manipulate the midi-chlorians to create life. And even though Padme was gone, and possibly Anakin's mother too, Palpatine knew how he could bring them back into the realm of the living. For a moment, Anakin contemplates this. However, his Jedi teachings come to get the better of him. He knows that Padme now is a part of the cosmic force, and she is still alive in his heart. Anakin remembers her and the good things that she did for him, even though their meetings were only brief. And Anakin knows that that good heart was now a part of the rest of the galaxy and that she was at peace. Anakin shakes his head and he begins to think poorly of the Chancellor. He's infuriated that one of his close confidants had been lying to him all of these years and that he was actually a Dark Lord of the Sith. Anakin hesitates for a moment and Palpatine senses this, telling Anakin that he can feel that desire within him to join him. Palpatine goads Anakin into giving to into his temptations, which he had been thinking about earlier, for he would be better off as a result. Anakin, though, given his increased resolve in this timeline, does not bend. Instead, he brings his own saber to his hand, and he tells Palpatine that he could not let him escape this office. Palpatine then smiles, and he utters the it's treason then, line before lunging at Anakin with his red saber. Anakin is about to enter the most ferocious duel of his life. Will he be able to hold up against the Dark Lord of the Sith? Let's keep going and find out. As the duel commences, Anakin can barely hold up against Palpatine's flurry of blows. Normally, Anakin is an offensive fighter. He isn't used to playing defense as much as he is forced to, <laughs> I hope you guys found that as funny as I did, against this Sith Lord, who is clearly adept in the ways of the lightsaber. Even when Anakin goes on the attack, he's parried well by Palpatine, who has mastered all of the lightsaber combat forms. Immediately after the duel begins, Mace Windu can sense that Anakin is in trouble. He grabs some Jedi that are close by, telling them that he can sense that Skywalker is in danger, and they run to the nearest speeder to come to his aid. While they're on their way, Anakin begins to exhaust himself, and he can feel that he is soon going to run out of energy. Palpatine encourages the young Jedi to tap into his darker emotions as a reserve and strike back against him with a fervor that he would have never experienced before. Palpatine says that it would be Anakin's first lesson in the ways of the dark side, and that if he didn't tap into those feelings of hatred and anger, that it could very well be his last. Anakin, though, remembering the teachings imparted onto him by Obi-Wan, and after remembering everything that mentoring Ahsoka had taught him, refuses to give in to Palpatine's demands. He remains staunch in his devotion to the light side, and he does what any good Jedi would. He keeps his commitment to the Order. At this moment, Palpatine becomes fed up, and he says that he'll rule the galaxy with or without Anakin. He unleashes a barrage of force lightning, which Anakin deflects with his lightsaber. It takes Anakin off guard though, and he's forced backwards against the power of the attack. 
It's at this moment that Mace Windu enters with his contingent of Jedi. He's shocked, <laughs> sorry guys, I had to do another one because of the force lightning, it's kind of funny, I like it, to see the Chancellor using a forbidden force power, and then he realized that Palpatine had been the Sith Lord that they had been searching for this whole time. He demands that Palpatine step away from Skywalker, but the evil master simply cackles and uses his other hand to push the Jedi backwards against another wall. Mace's contingent fall back, but he remains strong, channeling the dark side energy of the pod. Mace ignites his lightsaber and joins the fight, assisting the fatigued Anakin in battle. The two Jedi do much better at subduing the Chancellor than Anakin had been performing alone, and eventually, when the other Jedi recover after hitting that wall, they're able to subdue the Chancellor together near the window of his office. Anakin demands that Palpatine surrender, but instead, he simply cackles, then he blasts a hole through the window before jumping out into the abyss below. Anakin and Windu look down for a moment, watching the Chancellor descend deeper into the depths of the Coruscant cityscape, their capes billowing in the wind. The next day, when the Senate convenes, their Chancellor is nowhere to be found. Everyone is incredibly confused, as he had been present for most of the wartime Senate sessions, and this was abnormal. However, it isn't unheard of for the Chancellor to not be present, and Mas Amida takes control over the crowd. Another odd thing that many senators notice is that Tarkin stands in the middle of the room beside Amida, something that is definitely off. Amida starts with an announcement, stating that Tarkin had an important message for the Senate to hear. Tarkin then proceeds to present them a pre-recorded hologram of the Chancellor, which he says that military command received late last night. Palpatine tells the Senate that he had been attacked by Jedi and that now he is on the run from the rogue military leaders. He describes this as a military coup and he is enraged. He states that during this time, he has executed Order 66, which occurred the night before following this assassination attempt, and that many of the Jedi have fallen to the Valiant clone soldiers. However, he also tells the Senate that he doesn't feel safe returning from hiding just yet, because there are still lots of Jedi that roam the galaxy. He also says that he is temporarily naming Tarkin as his interim Chancellor, something that shocks many within the Senate. As the hologram finishes, the senators are left in a stunned silence, something that definitely doesn't happen often with politicians. They can't believe what they've just heard. Opponents to further the militarization of the Republic are not in favor of Tarkin, a military commander taking control of the government, and they call for the Senate to execute Order 67, which would mean that the Chancellor would be removed from office by the clones. Yet, with the context of having the Jedi betrayed the Republic and high emotions within the Senators, this motion is voted down. Instead, Tarkin is welcomed with applause. In this timeline, instead of Padme uttering the infamous applause line, it is Panaka who says that this is how Liberty dies, with thunderous applause. Mace and Anakin both manage to escape the rampage of the clones on Coruscant. However, the rest of their Jedi contingent isn't so lucky. The two end up securing a ship off of Coruscant after running back through the Chancellor's office and down to the landing pad, and they meet with Obi-Wan and Yoda at a remote location far, far away from the galactic core, as Yoda and Obi-Wan have both also survived the events of Palpatine's massacre. There, they end up receiving a call from Bail Organa, who is with Senator Panaka and Mon Mothma in a secure location on Coruscant. The four of them discuss future steps for the Jedi, and it is agreed that with current sentiment in the Senate and the Republic, it would be best for all four Jedi to go into hiding together. But if things continue to deteriorate, and if Tarkin ended up abusing his power, then the Senators would surely call the Jedi back into action. Panaka looks at Anakin and thanks him for his service to him and to the people of Naboo. Now, during this time of immense conflict, Panaka promises Anakin that he will look out for him, just as Anakin did during the Clone Wars. It is decided that the four Jedi will depart for Dagobah together, and that they will train in the shadows, waiting to be called back into service. How does this impact the rest of our story? Let's keep going and find out. As time passes, Palpatine continues to remain missing. Tarkin rules the Senate with an iron fist, and he continues to push for policies that consolidate his powers in the Chancellorship while furthering the militarization of the Republic. 
He justifies this with the continued war against the Separatists. He ends up ridding the military of clones due to his personal vendetta against them, and eventually replaces them with his vision for a galactic military composed of conscripts and voluntary enlistees. He continues to tell the Senate that Palpatine is still supporting his regime, but questions continue to rise within the Senate body as to where Palpatine truly is. Many believe that he's dead and that Tarkin is lying to the galaxy. Yet there's no one courageous enough to actually challenge this tyrannical ruler. Anaka, Mon Mothma, and Bail Organa work in the shadows, trying to further their own political clout, working against the reign of Tarkin. Tarkin refuses to put Dooku on trial due to his clear treason against the Republic. Instead, he incarcerates him indefinitely, and the political idealist dies while awaiting execution in prison. The war with the Separatists rages on with no end in sight. Due to the effectiveness of gaining numbers through conscription, the Republic is able to counter the production of droids by the Confederacy. The war churns on, only benefiting the war profiteers and political opportunists that capitalize off the suffering of the galaxy. The Jedi continue to train in the shadows. They remain on Dagobah, rooting themselves deep into the Force. They know that one day they will be called upon to help rid the galaxy of the proliferating authoritarianism, and they make sure that they keep their skills up to date. Anakin starts to morph into who he truly is meant to be, and he begins to live up to the title of the Chosen One. While Anakin hadn't had the ability to defeat Palpatine the first time, he was now starting to gain the powers to do so. His seniors are confident that he is able to stand his own against the Dark Lord, should it ever come to that. He also learns the interesting power of Force Judgment, which is essentially the light side counter to Palpatine's Force Lightning, something that could be used in the future to knock the Sith off guard, and a Force power he couldn't learn in the main timeline when he had the suit on. The clones, feeling disenfranchised by their new government, organize small-scale revolts and protests of their own throughout the Republic. They are promptly squashed by Tarkin's ever-present hand, but their rebellion spreads seeds of dissidence into the hearts of certain citizens. The idea of revolution is planted. Now, it only needed time to spread. Many Separatists welcome clones who are feeling frustrated with the Republic government, stating that they will help them to rebuild their lives. Some of them are even inducted into the Separatist military as commanders, but there are so many clones who do not want to defect simply based off of their ingrained loyalty to the initial ideals of the Republic. They want to see change from within, not join a different state that is trying to gain independence. One citizen in particular goes around the galaxy helping to liberate small communities finding themselves oppressed by the new Tarkin government. She's anonymous, known only by the name of Fulcrum. She becomes a beacon of hope for those feeling distraught, and her actions lead to better quality of life for many in the Republic. Things seem bleak for the galaxy. However, there's still a small prick of light for those who are seeking rejuvenated life. In addition, the shadow of Palpatine still looms over the galaxy, and the question of whether or not he is truly alive 